Thank you very much. I had no idea. I was I was a uh, keynoting a, a cult. That's wonderful. Uh, it's not, just a thought. Anyway, uh, and you have to you have to picture a little bit about what's happening because while you're seeing the big floating head on the screen, I'm literally looking over 400 empty chairs. So it's a very depressing scene. Uh, but I'm coming to you from Chicago. We're in the midst of the American Library Association conference, and I'm glad I could join you. I have to say I would so much rather be where you are because, one, it sounds like the drinking has already begun. Um, but Australia is just one of my favorite places in the whole world, and I realize it's really big, but like every square kilometer, is, I just love it. Anyway. Um, I'm also going to uh, apologize a bit because rather than just getting up and doing a stand-up comedy routine, which I originally proposed but they said probably wouldn't work, um, I'm going to, to read um, some of my presentations, but don't worry, it'll be a dramatic reading and I won't be monotone and I won't mumble too much. But it, the, the whole gist of it is that words are important and the words that we use are important and so I want to make sure I get them right. So. This is now where we go to the technology portion of our day. It's also, by the way, a symptom that when you're heading into your third decade in academia, it is easier to write seven pages than it is to do a PowerPoint slide. So you have that to look forward to. Um, so, all right, we're going to do a little technology voodoo here. Hold on a moment. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, which is just a little freaky. Um, and then I'm going to do this. So hopefully you are now seeing a little floating head and a very, very big, very good, and, and a very, and a very big slide that that clearly says that I, I don't want a job in an information school anymore. But let's go at it. All right. I real, there you go. Um, I realize that the new librarianship in the events title refers to the profession, uh, but I'd like to think of it uh, for the reasons of my talk as a reference to a new view of the profession. I would also like to let you know that many of the ideas in this talk were strongly shaped by ongoing conversations with Darren Freeberg, who is also equally crazy and interesting at the University of South Carolina. The good stuff is his and the bad stuff is mine. I also promise that we are going to start to venture into some pretty abstract places, but it all, I promise, I promise, I promise, has direct impact on your day-to-day -day life as a librarian. So with that slide. In his book, Sapiens, Harari talks about the major historical movements in the history of humanity. Yes, we're going to start a really rousing conversation with the history of humanity. That's where we're going today. Uh, one of these he calls the cognitive revolution. About 70,000 years ago, humans developed the ability to treat abstraction as reality. Concepts that have little to no connection to our biology, such as family, tribe, government, later nations, money, allowed homo sapiens to organize into ever larger and more complex groupings. Where our nearest relatives, the apes, can exist in groups of tens and must create strong interpersonal bonds, sometimes of a very intimate nature, mankind could relate to literally billions, as we do in global markets, and interact with people we've never met. In essence, because we believe that a dollar has a certain value, we can purchase a gadget from a woman in China even though we have never actually met this woman before. Or we can pretend that we're going to listen to this weird guy who likes bow ties even though we're not quite sure he's sane. Think for a moment about the communities to which you belong. Librarians, Australians, etc. These, in a very real sense, exist only in our shared imagination. Right? There is nothing that says Australia is this geography and this place with this makeup. And as much as a certain U.S. president would love to think that a wall defines geography, they're merely abstractions that we all sort of agree to believe in. They have power because we believe they have power. If you lose this common belief, then currencies become worthless, governments fall, and professions disappear. Put simply... Ideas matter and are reality because they shape our behavior. A lot of time, and this is why I'm starting with 70,000 years ago, a lot of our preparation of new librarians are all about our skills and our metadata and how this works and how we organize that and where do we put this, etc. Take that for what it's worth. But 
the basic concepts and premises of why we do that are important. Why start with a history in talking about new librarianship? Because these ideas and abstractions must constantly evolve to survive, but more importantly, fundamentally these abstractions shape us. John Palfrey in his book Bibliotech talks about this when he addresses the dangers of nostalgia. He warns about it, out, how out-of-date notions held by our communities, be they communities of scholars, students, townsfolks, or government, too, ma too many hold on to the idea of libraries as quiet book palaces. These ideas are often formed early in a person's life, so they may be decades out of date. Worse still, they are often based on the views of people when they were children. So let me just take that a moment. A lot of people, when they look at libraries, Think about libraries as they were 30 years ago from the perspective of a seven-year-old. Right? A new he calls for a new nostalgia, a new abstraction around libraries and librarians. But we must be careful about the abstractions and narratives that we adopt. They can shape us in unexpected ways. Take the terms we use to refer to those that we serve. Do librarians serve patrons, users, customers? This is not a trivial matter. It is not simply a choice because these words are connected to narratives that shape ourselves and how we interact with the world. We had patrons because libraries existed as cultural heritage institutions that depended on the patronage of a supported gentry. We have customers now because we live in a commercial society where people are either sellers of services or consumers of those services. Now, I can't see you, but I just want to take a, a guess. How many of you, raise your hands if you agree that you believe you provide excellent service to your users? He pauses as if he could pretend he could see it, but I'm going to guess that's a lot of hands. Now, <laughs> all right, or better yet, give me a hoot if you feel that you provide excellent service to your users. Now, give me a hoot if you love being used. Yeah. I'm not even going to consumer, folks, but the words matter, right? So, is this the relationship we want with our communities? Do we really look at those that pay taxes or tuition or overhead as consumers of a product of us? Or do we want to see a community in which librarians, professors, students, or business people work together to support the betterment of the community? Are libraries buildings to display books or community hubs extending an equitable invitation to young and old to learn and participate? Because here's the trick about nostalgia and about abstractions, about words and about narratives. Not only do they shape us, but we have an opportunity and I would argue the obligation to shape them. That's what we're here to do today. Because it's time for a new shared idea, a new librarianship, one that is informed by our history but not bound by it, one that aligns ourselves to the needs of today but in such a way that it positively influences and shapes the, our future. Because, you see, the core of the current shared abstraction that is shaping our field is not books or materials. It is the ideas of information. And increasingly, it is not even information, it is data. When you think about the central concepts and ideas that you heard in classrooms way too many times, it all circled around this thing called information and we inform people and we provide information and we link to information and we organize information and we're information professionals. The problem with this dataist approach as uh, Harari calls it his follow-up to Sapiens called Homo Deus, which frankly is not as good as the first one but read it anyway, uh, flattens our views of communities and those we seek to serve to algorithms and processors not people and their aspirations. Information providers have users that take in data, process it, and enact behavior. If that sounds too foreign or sterile or you'd never say that or you'd never agree to that, ask yourself how comfortable you are with the idea that libraries provide materials to enrich a love of reading. 
Libraries provide the essential information for citizens of a democracy to make informed decisions. Business need, businesses need access to the latest data to improve the bottom line. All of those statements are in the form of data into a process to an action. Let me be really clear, right? Libraries enrich, we provide materials to enrich the love of reading. Once again, we provide data into a process that leads to an action. We provide essential information for citizens in a democracy to vote. We provide what? Information to what process? Citizens to do what? Votes. Right? Great sounding calls to actions around intellectual freedom too often talk about opportunity to the market and too little about what it means to be human and have access to knowledge. It can be hard to see because we live inside this narrative every day in every corner of our lives. We too often have accepted the role of libraries as an answer to access instead of as an agent of impact. The narrative is so powerful that we no longer even see the difference between access and impact. Access to information equals positive impact in people's lives. Duh. But I need to step back. I'm using terms that we haven't yet defined. You may think we have defined words like information and data. In truth, however, we use these terms without a deep foundation and is causing confusion. What I kind of like to think about of the term of information is it is the equivalent in libraries of sort of conversational lubricant. It allows us to smooth through all the edges where we don't know what we're talking about. It's lovely. So I'm going to use these definitions. Right? of data and information, and most importantly, knowledge and knowing. Data are discrete objective facts, or raw measurements and observations which are unorganized, unprocessed, and do not convey any specific meaning, such as eight, just eight. Information is the organization and or processing of that data in the meaningful patterns, eight degrees Celsius. Knowledge consists of the beliefs, attitudes, experiences, and structures that exist in the mind, subconscious and conscious, and influence behavior. It's eight degrees outside. That's cold. I'm going to wear a coat. Knowing is the conscious application of that knowledge, i.e. actually putting on the coat, as opposed to walking out the door, freezing your, and I've heard it said before, so I'm allowed to say it now, ass off and wondering why you didn't wear a coat. There's probably nothing in here that surprises you, though perhaps you're less aware of the term knowing as a verb. It initially appears to be in the form of the data, information, knowledge, wisdom, hierarchy, dun, da, da, dun, that you probably heard about in class. Or you can Wikipedia it. It's all good. However, the one thing before we go any further that we must acknowledge is that all of these terms are defined from the perspective of the individual. That is, what is data? Our data depends on how sort of Conan the grammarian you are. Now, uh, knowledge and so on is ultimately defined by what a person thinks in a given context. What I see as data, you may not. What I see as knowledge, you may not. Why is that important? Because for too long, librarians have focused on the wrong thing. Either we have confused things like books and documents, images, articles, and so on with knowledge, or we have seen information as somehow objective and universal. Picking up on my earlier point that we confuse access for impact, that is really a confusion between information and knowledge. In the information narrative that pervades our profession, we see providing someone with access to information as our job because we assume that information is power. If we want greater literacy in the outback, we build a library, or even better, lay some fiber, and that community has access to information. Now they can learn and get better. A term we never seem to well define other than have better access. So, so what if materials in the library don't reflect the experiences, cultures, or values of that distance community? Information's information. Let's ship boats full of books to sub-Saharan Africa when what they really need is biomedical research trapped behind paywalls. Or let's ship books to the tribal lands instead of providing a platform for them to tell their stories to reach the rest of the world. The author 
Tramanda um, Adichie, talks about the power of fiction. She talks about how so often the stories of the African nations are reduced to war, poverty, and need. So often that soon that's all that we in the West, and I'll blame me in the West, see. She argues what is needed are stories. Stories of girls coming of age in Uganda or fathers raising children in Rwanda. We need stories of real life and images of the ordinary so we can connect to the African people. So that we can know the people of Africa, not simply be informed about them. Because at the end of the day, as new librarians, your job is not to inform your community. It is to improve your community. A community of scholars or a city or a school should be better because of the work you do. But what is better? Isn't more informed and more connected better? Isn't the ability to access and analyze data faster better? That's what a data and information narrative would tell us. Yet what happens if instead of taking those things for granted, we push on them a bit? For example, take the concept there we go. Sorry about that. Take the concept of information literacy. In an information data narrative, information literacy is the ability to better process information. By gaining greater sophistication in how we evaluate information sources, how we make better decisions, then we're going to be better, goes the logic. Except it doesn't work. Humans keep getting in the way. This is sort of a running theme in my life. Humans keep getting in the way. Kind of like a university would be such a nicer place without the students. Think about it. <laughs> study after study show that if you ask a group, how good are you at seeking out information, and run them through expert instruction and information seeking and selection, and at the end ask the group, so how are you? They will invariably tell you they are better. When, when you do an actual analysis of their performance, they're the same. So for, for a lot of people, information literacy is making people feel more comfortable about their lousy skills. And I don't think that's what we intended. But it gets worse. But wait, it gets worse. Psychology study after psychology study show us that if someone holds an erroneous idea, presenting that person with evidence of the error, hi, you're wrong, here's the right answer, only leads them to have a stronger belief in the error. Yep, showing someone that they are wrong leads them to be more confident in their error. Unless, and here's the important part, you can get them to first acknowledge their own ignorance. The irony of information literacy, indeed of all education, is that to make someone smarter, you must first get them to accept how ignorant they are. The amazing thing is this is not just true for individuals, but also for groups and communities and whole societies. No one in the Dark Ages thought of themselves as ignorant. No one in the 12th century Europe walked around saying, if only I knew more, life would be better. And I, I sorry, it's Monty Python, Holy Grail. It's all I can see is people, there's some lovely muck over here. You know, so anyway, they weren't walking around going, if only we had more lovely muck. Sorry. But I digress. Because they thought they knew it all already. They thought all that was to be known was known. Either it had been discovered in the glories of Rome or it was already encoded in the Bible. How to live a good life, how to grow trees, why people die, it was known. It's God's will, do this on the third day, whatever. This is what Socrates thought. It was not until a society first acknowledged that knowing more about botany, physics, chemistry, anatomy, and the world around them could lead to discovery and a better life that they could extend our lifespans, build new machines, and eventually fly to the moon. In order to advance in the possibilities of knowledge, they first had to admit there was much they didn't know. They had to embrace their ignorance. It's a different narrative. In information and data, we look at you and we say, you're great, you're new librarians, you're these wonderful active conduits, go out and inform the world. Spread data as if it were seed that we could put in this wonderful 
fertile ground of the populace, and boom, they're brilliant. Yay! Sorry, that's a very weird metaphor. But the point being that you can shovel all the fertilizer of knowledge you want at an unknowing person, and unless they first say, boy, I really have no clue what I'm doing, it's not going to help. This is something we tend not to teach new librarians in the world of information because we assume that simply accessing information is sufficient, and it's not. Think about how this has changed the work you do today. Instead of seeing a library as a container of all the knowledge there is, a library became a place to discover new knowledge. Monastic and academic libraries that once held the truth became college and public libraries that helped scholars and students and citizens invent and grow. And this was not just in the sciences. Humanities blossomed to explore the very nature of our relationship to the universe and each other. Rather than referring to a holy book for how we should understand a text, we now stock journals that fostered conversations among scholars. Education was no longer initiation, it was enlightenment. To be sure, this came at a cost. And not everything about the enlightenment was that enlightened. Read colonization and how we began this session but it changed the narrative of the world. It is tempting to see the emerging dataism and information as an extension to this movement. After all, we can now mine data for discovery. Yay! Information and information technology seem like new liberators that link people to discovery. However, this is where a new librarian, you must keep a critical eye. Because the danger we must avoid and I think the one of the central purposes of the field of library and information science is to not look at data stores and algorithms as the new holy texts that hold all the answers. To be sure, massive scale computing and the explosion in data generating devices have brought fantastic benefits to our lives. Google allows us to search across trillions of web pages in milliseconds. Wikipedia allows us to as a global society to build an open repository of ideas, histories, and concepts. Embedded medical devices can now allow patients and doctors to monitor and maintain health anywhere in the world. I am not asking you to do it, dismiss these advances. You do not have to hand in your iPhone and Apple Watch on the way out, I promise. The question instead is when we believe that these advances are always positive, or at least neutral, and that they are sufficient. Let me take these in turn. Many of you have smartphones, so give me, give me a call out if you've got a smartphone. All right, making sure you're still awake. iPhones and Android phones that allow you to run apps alongside texting, and maybe if you've got nothing better to do and it's accidental and it's usually your mother, you make a phone call on them. How much time a day do you spend on the internet using the phone. Now, I normally ask this of an audience and I ask them to, you know, all right, if you use this for one hour, put your hand up. But once again, all I'm looking at is a lovely black circle with a green light next to it. So, I'll tell you what I normally find, but you're welcome to follow along at home. I ask, how many of you are on the net for one hour? And just about every hand goes up, right? Facebook, Twitter, surfing the web, getting directions, one hour. Then I ask, all right, keep them up if you're on two hours. About 80% 80 80 of the hands stay up. If I go three hours, I'm down to about 40% of the crowd. By the time I hit five hours, like it's like three smart asses in the back of the room, right? But maybe you just did this. I don't know. The real answer, the real answer however, is 24 hours a day. Right now, some, literally right now, Someone in California knows where you are. Probably what you are doing, which I'm sure is listening to me with rapt attention and not checking your email or shopping, um, and who you're with. If your phone is on the net, it's on the internet with or without you. When there was an earthquake on the west coast, US scientists found that they could just as accurately predict when the earthquake was, where the epicenter was, by how people's fitness trackers vibrated or their phones went back and forth. There's a scientist at Harvard 
who realized that he could hack in to the GPS and sensors within a phone to determine in cold and flu season within 90% accuracy whether you had the flu. And we think of these chips as, oh, I need to know how to get to the street, you know, to, the, to the school down the street or across town. But it's got enough minute detail that they could understand that when you have the flu, you use the phone like this. Uh, boom. Right? Whereas normally the day is like, la, 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 la. That's a technical term, by the way. And so imagine that. They, I have an Apple Watch because I'm a geek. I'm wearing a bow tie. It's true. And they've now realized that they can actually determine how the, what your code is on your, your smart watch by how hard you tap and in what direction. People are talking about stealing your identity based on how you use a mouse because it is so unique to you. Is that a good thing? Did you realize that? Are you okay with that? Are, you, are those that you serve okay with that? Every day, data collected from phones and bank transactions and credit cards and Fitbits and watches and cards that allow you on the tram system and where you Uber and what app you use determine who gets into college or owns a home or gets health care or gets social benefits. These determinations come from algorithms written by people who are seeking to make money or save money or only determine who the right people are for some action. That is not neutral. Take your home internet connection. In the U.S., home connections to the internet are overwhelmingly asynchronous, meaning they allow you to download data at a much higher rate than upload. Why? In essence, you can watch 3,000 cat videos in the time it takes you to upload one. I'm just saying what the internet's good for. Why is that asynchronous nature in there? Because the assumption is that you're going to consume more traffic in the form of media than you'll produce. Right? You're going to watch more YouTube than you upload. Is it a coincidence that the major internet providers in the U.S. also happen to make most of their money by the media that you consume, not the media that you produce? If that just got dark, it's getting fun around here. Not a problem. So just so you know, they're now cleaning the room that I'm in. This is a really fun moment. Let's all take a moment and realize just how surreal it is to get a keynote from halfway around the world. This is not about neutrality. Anyway, I digress. I do that a lot. Maybe you've noticed. And then there's the question of, is information sufficient to gain knowledge? Is information or data sufficient for knowledge? The answer is clearly no. We've already talked about the annoying ability of human beings to ignore evidence that they disagree with, but we can go even further. Take the 22nd, 2016 U.S. presidential election, or as they said in the old comedy routines, take the 2016 presidential elections, please, because I don't want them anymore. All of the major media polling data showed one result, and that result was wrong. Was it wrong because the pollsters didn't know how to do statistics? No. In fact, statistics were extremely complex and had proven successful for over decades. Was it because there was too little data? Absolutely not. There was an enormous amount of time and money spent on representative sampling. Was it because the polls weren't believed? Nope. In fact, the reporting and media narratives supported and corroborated the findings of those polls. Then why was it wrong? Simple answer. People, once again, people get in the way. The people who ran the polls started with the assumption of who to talk to, who tells the truth, how many people vote based on demographic information. The data ultimately reflected more about the people who made the polls than the people that they polled. We have come to assume that more data brings us closer to reality. More information is more informed and that these data are neutral, that the information is abstract and neutral. The truth is that the data are collected at the direction of people who are biased and working on a shared worldview. Moreover, just as too little data can provide a skewed view of the world, too much data can lose nuance and distinction in a complex reality. So, I'm asking you 
to critically look at the dataist approach. What's the alternative? Or at least, what modification am I proposing? What is the new nostalgia? I mean, this is, this, the great answer is, this is where I say thank you. I'm glad I've just told you everything you've just learned is wrong and you're screwed and I leave. This could happen. But they're, you know, not going to happen. So what is the new nostalgia? What's new librarianship about? What is this new narrative that takes us beyond simply informing people and connecting people and assuming we've made them better? The short answer is knowledge. This is not a squishy concept. It's not like, oh, it's all about love. No, this is about knowledge, right? It's not a field concept. We know a lot about knowledge. And the process of knowledge construction, we call it learning. This is also not a Luddite call to go back to the days of Catherine Hepburn reciting, a few shall not fall tonight in the 1950s. And if you don't get that reference, really library schools have let you down. You need to go watch Death Set. Spencer Tracy, it is amazing. I love it. Anyway. You watched it last night, didn't you? Curfew shall not fall tonight. Oh, they're on stanza 10. This is great. It's like, good lord. All right. Do you know about Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy? I mean, does that, is the fact that they sort of illicitly hooked up throughout their life in part of that conversation as well, it brings a whole new spin to the movie. Anyway. But I digress. Instead... I'm talking about building and engaging relationships with our communities and facilitating conversations around the hopes and aspirations of that community. Too often, we focus on deficiencies. Who can't read? Who needs economic development? Who isn't college ready? Our data is great at showing us what we are not. We need to know what is the narrative of the community. Do we, the community and the librarian together, want to be outstanding research universities? Do we want to be a literate town or an engine of economic development or simply the place where the best quality of life? And no algorithm and no bit of data, no collection of databases can with passion and fidelity define ideas like what we mean by the quality of life. And this is where we link the abstract with the immensely concrete. To do this is not a simple matter of staffing a building and waiting for questions and a community. Knowledge is all about learning, and that is participatory. It requires us to be in the community, proactively seeking conversations. Reference librarians must be in the classroom and the lab and the halls of commerce. Not there to advertise libraries, but to listen to the conversations. Participate when we can but always look to link conversations and communities together. Cataloging and acquisitions needs to be more about knowing what people are trying to learn than what materials are available. Yes, we can use data such as circulation statistics. And, oh, by the way, say hi to Australia. Hey, what's up, man? There you go. <laughs> Just continuing a little bit of the surreal experience you have in. New Library and Forum. Cataloging and acquisition needs to be more about knowing what people are trying to learn than what materials are available. Yes, we can use data such as circulation statistics and holds to do that, but more powerful is sitting with the community members and asking them, what are you passionate about? Tell me your story. Every library should have production facilities to capture oral histories, publish the work of the community, and stream out podcasts of community voices. We think as librarians that the, the most altruistic thing that we can tell a person is, how can I help you? We look at that as a gift that we are giving to the community. We're here to be for you. But think for a moment how arrogant that statement is. How can I help you. How can I, because clearly as a librarian and someone sitting behind a very large oak desk surrounded by materials, help you, because you clearly need help. Right? As opposed to, hey, what you doing? What's going on? What are you passionate about? What are you working on? Anything I can be part of? Very different dynamic. Remember, knowledge is not about consumption. It's about making meaning, and that comes from conversation. Can I go to your library and hear the voices of your people? 
Ultimately, we do not have users or consumers or patrons. We have people seeking to make meaning in their lives. They, they do that through what they read, but also what they write. They do that by watching and sharing. As new librarians, and I hope new librarians who adopt a new librarianship, you are now a core of community engagement activists. Your job is not about materials or buildings. Those are tools. Your job is about people. What with your community being your true collection. You are not gatekeepers, but rather weavers of community narratives and understandings. You must be brave in bringing together the discordant voices of our members, bold in reaching out of your comfort zone to make those around you comfortable in sharing and learning. This is all about being community activists. This is all about taking on the problems and needs and aspirations of what a community is, of taking all members of a community, whatever, whatever religion or color or class or educational status, whether that's within a university context, a public context, a school context, it is all about crafting together a narrative that says, this is where I live. This is how I understand the world. This is what it means to be human here. That's such an amazing, powerful concept that blows away the concepts of data and information and repository. What we're talking about is taking librarianship as functionaries and curators of collections, as people who link and connect information, and changing them into community narrists community connectors, community advocates that sees a better today and sees a better tomorrow and works to make it happen. And it doesn't happen by sitting behind a desk and it doesn't happen by standing in a building and it doesn't happen, I sound like I'm about to go into green eggs and ham, but the point of this is <laughs> to be a new librarian is to be an amazingly powerful thing that is desperately needed in our communities all around this globe today. What we're talking about is how do we help people understand and learn? How do we help them appreciate and understand where they want to be? And now is the time to do it. Now as our communities call out for what does the future look like? Where do we go? What can we be? How do we deal with our history and our present and our future? And that's what librarianship is about whether we're doing it in a building or whether we're doing it across town or whether we're doing it through Skyping across continents. I am so glad that you are new librarians and you're joining our field because the other thing that people will not tell you is that you have the most astounding gift that can never be taught. In fact, the irony is you have the most astounding gift that the more we teach you and the more experience we provide that you gain, you lose. And that is your new perspective. We've been doing this too long. These gray hairs, I would love to say were natural as a baby, but they weren't. I see the world through the traumas and the crises and the attempts and the things that worked and the things that didn't work over decades in this field. I need you to look at me and say, Dave, take a moment, step back. We could do this differently. And if you find yourself in an institution, and you find yourself in a community, or you find yourself in a library, or you find yourself in a situation where people do not appreciate that as a fundamental gift, then you're probably in the wrong place. But we need to get started, and we need to do it now. Thank you very much for your attention and dealing with the bizarre situation that we're in. You have a very enthusiastic audience here. And we do have time for perhaps two or three very quick questions. We've got um, – we need to finish on time because the next session starts fairly quickly after this. But we'd love to hear from some of you. There's some microphones. You need to grab one of those. If you could just give us your name, please, as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh-oh, just a minor mic malfunction. 
It's all right, David, we're still here. <laughs> Technology, tricky. <laughs> you think we're connected across the world, yet we can't make the microphone work. <laughs> That's all right. I've just given my first keynote in which it involved someone cleaning up a room, so it all is good. <laughs> okay. All right. It's over here. One, two. Working? Yeah. I hear it. Um, hi. Um, my name is Marta, and I, I'm a new librarian, three years in a public library. I have an education background and a community arts background. My understanding of what you're saying is um, community cultural development practices are really what need to be embedded in librarianship. Um, is that correct? You're that, nodding yes. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> was that the whole question? Uh, that was just, I just wanted to clarify because I do have that background and that's what I go into. It. However, trying to transfer that into the workplace, I don't think is as easy based on existing structures and um, people who've been there for a long time. So, Sounds like you've heard so that before. So how do you actually um, transfer that? Um, Guerrilla Tactics 101. Uh, this is the hardest thing as a library science educator that I have to figure out, so I'm going to also try to answer quickly. Um, we teach you how to do things. We teach you skills and we teach you to remember a lot of vocabulary. The true value of a, libra a library is the librarian. It's the human aspect that makes things happen. If that's the case, think of yourself as the instrument. We talk about collection development, we talk about quality, we talk about all this stuff. How do we teach people to be the quality and the value so that you feel comfortable to engage in people that you may not normally engage with? How do we create a comfort level with librarians where they see their own value? And that revolves a huge amount of self-reflection. And then as you say, how do we give them for lack of a better word, anthropological and communication skills so that they can engage communities and value their perspectives, not simply find them foreign or dismissive. So absolutely, those are important things. Yes. Testing? Yes. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Anna. <laughs> <laughs> I just was dying to do I that the whole time. In Sorry. a government library. Yes. Um, may I start by saying that bow ties are cool and yours is a particularly grand specimen for this seminar. <laughs> and like a seven year old, I've been walking around all day going, I tied it myself. I did. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I. Just to prove, <laughs> just evidence. All right. I ahead. am interested in finding out um, your comment, if possible, in terms of information slash data repositories. Um, more and more um, in the field that I work in, we see um, the need for the business workforce wanting information quickly and succinctly, where all of the data sets that are available out there um, um, in the public domain is crunched down to a summary of particular trends in particular industries. Um, do you have any comments on that? A couple of comments. One, um, I want to say that I, once again, it's like the Levite comment. Have, data and information are important and essential things that help us do our real job. So this isn't simply saying we need to get rid of all data and just go back to lovely volumes. And so data management and building data repositories, we should understand how to do that. But once again, we should understand that in science, for example, the push to distribute data is not simply a question of, look, there's more data for more research. It's also a validity check. It's part of the conversation. It's put up or shut up. And so having cues and understandings and analytics about the data themselves in an obvious and open way is part of a conversation, part of how we learn, and part of what we need to do. In terms of repositories, too often institutions see them as silos where we collect our stuff and put our stuff in. In academia, the fact that, David, you can get to all my papers is useless. It's the idea that we can have a community that's talking about it, reflecting it. In essence, what we did in journals, we can now do online. And so connecting communities are vitally important. The last part of that is I do not in any way want to dispute the idea that businesses and, frankly, governments and schools and individuals and citizens need ready access to data and tools to organize them. My fear is that all too often we give them the tools to collapse, analyze data and pretend that those tools are neutral in how they analyze data and what they see. 
from the statistics they chose, they chose, they choose to how they visualize the information, to the code necessary to the computing platform it goes on, are all ways that influence how data is interpreted and builds knowledge. And so, yes, we need fast, good data repositories, but we need librarians sitting on top of them, making sure that we are curating them and informing a community how to ethically and appropriately use that data. That was a really bunch of gobbledygook, but I hope somewhere in there was a truth. Okay, I think we've got time just for one more very quick question, if anyone has one. No? Yeah. Oh, yes, one more. Thank you. Hey, uh, my name's James. I'm a librarian from um, Bondi, uh, Waverley Library. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to uh, get your comment on um, librarians as um, a progressive uh, field. Um, because uh, from the US, um, there is a sort of an ongoing uh, political crisis. And you were saying that we need to be in Congress, we need to be wherever we are, to wherever we can be to, uh, to collect information. But also because there is so much, so much misinformation out there being spread on the online primarily, but it's also being weaponized. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know, um, there is an ongoing conversation amongst young librarians particularly about how we cannot remain neutral mm -hmm. uh, at, in these times. And um, where you have found uh, over the course of your career that you have not been able to remain neutral. Yeah, that, that's first. There's a quick answer. Um, <laughs> let me do it. Let me, let me, actually, it's a good way to end. It's not that you, we, we, can't, we should never ask, can we remain neutral? Because the answer is we've never been and never are able to be neutral. Librarianship is a political field because it deals with empowerment, and the root of empowerment is power. You cannot give, empower someone. You cannot give them power unless you have it yourself. You can't teach someone to read unless you can read. You can't buy them a collection of materials unless you have the funding to go out and buy them. So it's already inherently a political field. And this idea that it's neutrality, we need to get rid of it. There's the idea of being intellectually honest, of understanding our privilege, of understanding our position, of understanding potential biases, but we must always acknowledge that we start from that foundation. And we need to go in and listen as much as we tell. So given that, that is different than saying that we are liberal or conservative, or in the United States, Republican or Democrat or what have you. Um, it is about being intellectually progressive in the sense that we declare as part of our principles that we seek to improve. And by doing that, by the very nature that you use the word improve, better, smarter, more able, whatever phrase you want to do, implies that you have an assumption or a view of what that is that is different from the status quo, which means that you see progress. And so what, what I'm really pushing on, because some people then push back and go, so librarians should in essence take over the world and tell them what's right. And I'm all for world domination through librarianship. Let me be very clear. Oh my God, look at that. That's, mm, there's, so, <laughs> that's, that's the, Lankus says domination, world like, and then the shining head. But what it means is that we work with our communities to come up with community definitions, but in those conversations with our communities, we are not mute. We don't stand by the side and say, why yes, I think a better community would reject all climate change and evolution and clearly spend a lot of time spray tanning. This is not the idea of what a librarian does. We sit there and say, but what about the evidence? What about this perspective? And let's hear from that person who doesn't normally have a chance to speak. We are the referees, the facilitators of the most important conversations in the world, and we're one of the few remaining professions that is seen as a credible person to create a civil, ongoing, honest, and sometimes painful discourse about what a better tomorrow is. And unless we accept that, we are going to continue to stand by the sides, which is going to mean sidelined, which means it's going to be obsolete. So by God, for all you new librarians who feel that you may be put down for being progressive, screw them. In 20 years, they're going to be retired and you own the world. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. We so value your time, your insights, your knowledge. 
um, your entertainment value, um, and above all, um, your passion. I'm sure all of us, both new and old librarians, um, are inspired not only for today, but moving forward. Thank you again. Thank you. I've got to go now watch a YouTube video on how to tie this again. <laughs> Bye, all. <laughs>